Hello everyone. I welcome all the learners to Youth Minds unique initiative 10 minutes and newspaper done. This is 11th July the Hindu discussion and most of the articles are analytical in nature. So it will benefit both the mains and prelims candidates. You can download the PDF of the gist from our Telegram channel or website Daily Current Affairs tab. So let us give you the most productive 10 minutes of the day. So first news is about World Population Day and women's reproductive autonomy. Now this news comes under the topic of role of women and women's organization, population and associated issues of GS Paper One. The theme of this year's World Population Day is unleashing the power of gender equality, uplifting the voices of women and girls to unlock our world's infinite possibilities. On World Population Day, which is July 11, India deserves to be commended for its family planning initiatives. But despite many challenges, the aim is to provide an increasingly comprehensive package of reproductive health services like short and long-acting reversible contraceptives, permanent methods, etc., to every potential beneficiary. India's commitment towards the Family Planning 2030 Partnership includes expanding its contraceptive basket. The inclusion of new contraceptive options advances women's rights and autonomy leading to a spike in modern contraceptive prevalence access to timely quality and affordable family planning services is crucial because unspaced pregnancies may have a detrimental influence on the newborn's health as well as major effects on maternal mortality morbidity and healthcare expenditure Now let's see the success of Indian family planning program. The Indian government's health population and development programs have shown steady progress over the years. Life expectancy at birth has significantly increased in the country compared to the 1990s. Indians are currently living a decade longer. The current rate of maternal mortality is 97 per lakh live births in a year, down from 254 per lakh live births in 2004. Another triumph of these programs is gender empowerment that India has cut the number of child marriages by half since 2000 and teen pregnancies have dramatically decreased. Now what are the drawbacks? According to the most recent National Family Health Survey 5, just 10% of women in India are independently able to make decisions about their own health. 11% of women believe that marital violence is acceptable if a woman refuses to have sex with her husband. Nearly half of all pregnancies in India are unplanned. Now there is a way forward. In countries experiencing rapid population growth like India, women's empowerment through education and family planning can bring enormous benefits by way of human capital and inclusive economic development. Focus on gender equality helps shift the focus away from the notion of population stabilization to population dynamics based on reproductive choices people make. Gender equality can be ensured by making investments in a woman's life at every stage from childbirth to adolescence to maturity. Engaging with women, girls and other marginalized people and formulating legislations or laws and policies that empower them to assert their rights and take life-changing personal decisions are the first steps in this direction. Second news, how urban India is reclaiming spaces for its communities. Now this news comes under the topic of urbanization, their problems and their remedies under GS paper 1. With India's growing urban population in need of open spaces there are few examples of how vacant unused or underused spaces are being reclaimed for the benefit of communities this approach that prioritizes people over infrastructure is called place making it aims to create public spaces that are more than just utilitarian and promote social interaction The initiative is part of a special project of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs under its Smart Cities mission. It is mostly implemented through urban local bodies, communities and MLAs and corporators. According to the ministry, 34% of India's population lives in cities. In 2021, it was 498 crore. Over 200 projects covering approximately 2.75 lakh square meter have been completed so far in more than 55 Indian cities. The first place making marathon was launched in October 
they involved upgradation of parks restoration of water bodies construction of plazas and creation of outdoor spaces in primary health centers and anganwadis from open air auditoriums to roadside parks cities are repurposing vacant unused or underused spaces to promote recreation and social interactions there are few examples like in a primary health center for child vaccination in jabalpur madhya pradesh an outdoor play and sitting area was created in odisha's raurkela a local pond was revived and the area around it was turned into a picnic spot third news the national commission for scheduled tribes notice to odisha's over attack on scheduled tribe migrant worker now this news comes under the topic of powers functions and responsibilities of various constitutional bodies under gs paper 2 Now let's read something about National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. It is a constitutional body that was established by the Constitution, 89th Amendment Act of 2003. The commission is an authority working for the economic development of scheduled tribes in India, and is dealt with in Article 338A. Before 2003, there was only one commission, which was for both the scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. In 2004, after the 89th Constitutional Amendment Act, the National Commission of Scheduled Tribes was established by bifurcating the National Commission for Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes into NCST and NCSC. The commission comprises a chairperson, a vice chairperson, and three full-time members, including one female member. The term of all the members of the commission is three years from the date of assumption. of charge fourth news the need for strengthening palliative care in the face of non communicable diseases now this news comes under the topic of issues relating to development and management of health sector under gs paper 2 so what is palliative care palliative care is the branch of medicine focusing on improving the quality of life and preventing suffering among those with life limiting illnesses it aims to identify patients at risk of over medicalization at the expense of quality of life and financial burden on the family it is often misinterpreted as end of life care However palliative care aims to improve the quality of life by addressing the physical psychological spiritual and social domains of the health of people suffering from life limiting diseases like heart failure kidney failure certain neurological diseases cancers etc so who all need palliative care palliative care in india has largely been available at tertiary healthcare facilities that to in urban areas so due to its skewed availability of services it is accessible to only 1 to 2% of the estimated 7 to 10 million people who require it in the country 55 million people in india are pushed below the poverty line every year due to health related expenditures and over medicalization The National Program for Prevention and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Diseases and Stroke is now the National Program for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases that is NPNCD includes chronic diseases whose treatment contributes the most to health related expenses but there are several gaps in the guidelines as per the Global Atlas of Palliative Care in 2020 the need for palliative care was higher for non-cancer illnesses but the guidelines in India mostly focus on the cancer there is lack of dedicated budget which has prevented the implementation of such programs and also the medical officers at primary health centers are not aware of such programs despite various government programs with palliative care provisions access remains abysmal ngos like karunashray and can support are trying to fill the gap but they have limitations on how much they can spend The guidelines have also skipped an opportunity to bring focus on children suffering from chronic diseases like cancer, birth defects, neurological conditions etc. So pediatric palliative care has been a neglected branch. So let's talk about the way forward. The World Health Organization recommends the use of morphine consumption per capita to assess morphine access for palliative care services which will help us to compare the progress of palliative care services in India and other countries. The 67th World Health Assembly in 2014 called for palliative care to be integrated into health systems at all levels. A three-tier health system, multiple national health programs and schemes and Ayushman Bharat health insurance scheme are all positive steps taken towards universal health coverage 
Fifth news is continuing with the same topic that is health sector under GS paper 2. A recently published study in the Lancet Global Health reiterated the promise of using wastewater for public health surveillance. This strategy played a role in confirming India's victory over polio virus. So what is wastewater surveillance? It is for known or new health threats offers many benefits for enhancing public health efforts. It is a cost-effective approach that does not rely on invasive samples from individuals with clinical symptoms. According to a recent report by Niti Aayog, the system grapples with issues like uneven coverage and siloed disease-specific efforts. Incorporating wastewater surveillance will not just fix these issues, but it could help reduce the reliance on any one source of data. This data could be compiled together with other sources of health data to provide real-time insights into community-level disease patterns, sometimes earlier than clinical data. So this could strengthen the capacity to detect diseases at an early stage, including in areas where access to healthcare facilities and diagnostic testing might be limited. The Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, which aims to create a seamless online platform for healthcare services, offers an opportunity for the integration of wastewater surveillance. So let's look at the way forward. Through strategic collaborations and proactive leadership, India can lead the way in integrated public health surveillance, offering a model that is alert, predictive, responsive and robust. This can be a key element in building a robust global health infrastructure capable of rapidly responding to public health threats. Sixth news, China protests the Lai Lama meeting US official Uzra Zia in New Delhi and calls it interference in China's internal affairs. Now this news comes under the topic of effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interests in GS Paper 2. Shizang is the Chinese name for Tibet and you should remember it for the prelims information. Shizang affairs are purely internal affairs of China and no external forces have the right to interfere. China firmly opposes any form of contact between foreign officials and the Tibetan independence forces. Seventh news is about the Global South and it comes under the topic of global groupings and agreements involving India under GS Paper 2. So why are we talking about the Global South? Because of the unwillingness of many leading countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America to stand with NATO over the war in Ukraine which has brought to the fore once again the term Global South. So what is meant by Global South? It refers to various countries around the world that are sometimes described as developing, less developed or underdeveloped. Most of this country, although not all, are in southern hemispheres, largely in Africa, Asia and Latin America. In general, you can call them poorer, have higher levels of income inequality and suffer lower life expectancy, harsher living conditions than countries in the global north, that is richer nations, that are located mostly in northern America, Europe, with some additions in Oceania and elsewhere. So what is the difference between the terms Global South and Third World? The term Global South appears to have been first used in 1969 by political activist Karl Oglesby. But it was only after the 1991 breakup of the Soviet Union, which marked the end of the so-called Second World, that the term the Global South gained momentum. Until then, the more common term for developing nations, countries that had yet to industrialize fully, was Third World. The term First World referred to the advanced capitalist nation. The second world to the socialist nation led by the Soviet Union and the third world to developing nations, many at the time still under the colonial yoke. Third world became a synonym for banana republics ruled by tin pot dictators. Thus, you can say that the global south is successor of the third world. Meanwhile, developed, developing and underdeveloped also faced criticism for holding up Western countries as the ideal while portraying those outside that club as backwards. So increasingly the term that was being used to replace them was the more neutral sounding Global South. Global South is more geopolitical and less geographical in nature because the term Global South, two largest countries China and India lie entirely in the Northern Hemisphere. Countries in the Global South were mostly at the receiving end of imperialism and colonial rule, with African countries as perhaps the most visible example. Given the imbalanced imperialist past relationship between many of the countries of the Global South and Global North, both during the age of colonial empire and the Cold War, it is little wonder that today many opt not to be aligned with any one great power.
Since the turn of the 21st century, there is a shift in wealth as the World Bank refers to from the North Atlantic to Asia Pacific. By 2030, it is projected that three of the four largest economies will be from the Global South, with the order being China, India, USA and Indonesia. Already the GDP in terms of purchasing power of the Global South dominated BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa surpasses that of the Global North's G7 club. And there are now more billionaires in Beijing than in New York City. Countries in the Global South are increasingly asserting themselves on the global scene, be it China's brokering of Iran and Saudi Arabia's rapprochement or Brazil's attempt to push a peace plan to end the war in Ukraine. 8 News Union Minister for Chemicals and Fertilizers says a special package estimated at 3.7 lakh crore rupees for farmers have to be brought in as the use of fertilizers has become unbalanced in the country. He said the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium ratio should have been 4 is to 2 is to 1, instead it is 8 is to 3 is to 1 in the country. The balance of the soil has been damaged and production has become saturated. Soil health, human health, animal health and environmental health are connected with one another. Overuse of fertilizers according to study resulted in 16% decrease in production in Punjab despite a 10% increase in the use of fertilizers. It is clear that balanced use of fertilizers is needed for steady production, food security and for helping farmers income too. Our attempt is to end import dependence on urea by 2025 and replace it with nano urea and other alternative forms of urea. Awareness has to be built among farmers about nano urea that it does not harm soil health. A 500 ml bottle of nano urea will replace one bag of 45 kilograms of urea and it will reduce the transportation costs as well. Thank you for watching. Let us know your feedback in the comments and if you find the video beneficial, please subscribe to our channel and keep visiting our website, Telegram, Instagram and Twitter.